I'm going to continue on. We're going to do a, a little bit of a virtual tour of Baptist Hill Cemetery. And so every semester when I have new students, um, I like to take them out to the cemetery and walk them through it and tell them a little bit about what I know of the cemetery. Typically, uh, it takes about 45 minutes to an hour. I know I got like 30 minutes here, so we're going to see how far we get. I've cut a little bit of, of, uh, of it out, and so uh, if we don't finish it all the way through, that's okay. I do want to make sure we stay on time for, for Tamala and for everyone else here so that you know we're still getting out. Um, on, on time. And so um, for me, uh, this is always a challenge. So when I only have one or two students, and, and typically I only get like one or two students, new students a semester, and so one or two will come in in a semester, one or two are graduating or moving on, and so, uh, so I don't have a, a very large crowd. But it's really important that when we go out to the cemetery that we respect that space. We've talked about it as a sacred space as well. And I think uh, for me to, to walk through there with a large crowd of people, I don't think would be very appropriate. And so um, I only take one or two, two people out there at a time when I, when I walk through and do the, do the tour. So I'm kind of excited to do it kind of virtually um, in, this position, in this kind of presentation. I don't know if we get the same impact that you would if you're standing right there in front of the, the, the stone at the grave. But um, I, I think that um, um, we can still feel a little bit of that of that that spirit and so um, um, and so I think that virtually I think it's a, a little bit better than taking a large crowd out there uh, so just because I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning so I am Robert Bubb <laughs> right I'm a lecturer in the human development and family studies department at Auburn University uh, I've been working for as uh, trying to, to write up some of these stories along with our group with our students uh, for two years now I think um, and so uh, we've got a few up there we have our hands on a whole lot of different projects um, and it took us a while to come up with the name, and we bounced off some, several different names, but we finally settled on, on this one, Research to Preserve African American Stories and Traditions, because it's more than just, uh, just you know, cemetery preservation, it's writing the stories and recording um, the, the family traditions as well. And so that worked out nice to be our past, right? So we can talk about our past, and so I guess that was important too, as we were coming up with the name, we needed something that was kind of catchy and descriptive at the, at the same time. Um, and so, uh, um, so whenever I begin the tour, we always start at the very beginning. And so if you're not familiar where, uh, where Baptist Hill is, and I'm pretty sure almost everyone here is familiar with it, but if you go out these doors here, you make a, a left on the street I can't pronounce, the bar to Len Ben, something like that. Is that close? I don't know, right? And so whenever I say it, it feels like I'm just like stuttering or something like that. And you take it to Thatch, you make a left on Thatch, you go all the way down Thatch, right? And at, at where Thatch ends on Dean Road, that's where that cemetery is going to be. You notice in the, the image here in the slide that it's kind of tilted um, 90 degrees. So north is that way where north actually is, going in that direction. Um, and then you have Old Mill over there. And so we usually start at the beginning of the, at the, of the cemetery and realize, you know, we're covering a lot of ground. So these are going to be very brief descriptions of these individuals. But part of it is try to get students to think a little bit um, about not only the people there, but also the time period. And so just really, sh really short with the Baptist Hill history. Most of you are familiar with it. But um, it was established in the early 1870s. Um, it was a communal cemetery. And so... Um, uh, it was donated, and although we're not entirely sure who was donated by, there's, there's uh, some people that believe that it's uh, Lonnie Payne, uh, and that could very, be, very well be. We know he donated the land for the Ebenezer Baptist Church, so it could be the cemetery as well. Um, uh, and so we're looking to that. We're still trying to figure out if that's who the individual was or not. If you have inf information on that, um, I know Terrence is going to look for a deed to see if it says it in the deed. If it does, that would be great to know. Um, but we start there, and we know it's a communal cemetery, and so once it was opened up, families just staked off the plots that they thought they would need um, for, the, for, their, for their relatives. Um, and so uh, just talking with some of the, the individuals that have families here in the cemetery, uh, to, to my knowledge, it sounds like most of, of those families that, have, that were uh, members of Ebenezer Baptist Church tend to be more congregated towards Dean Road. We also have an area up, up here where there's a lot of uh, depressions in the ground where there are no no markers as well, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And we and when we do the tour, we talk about that also. But you can't really talk about Baptist Hill, um, so yeah, the marker there, the, the entrance. But you can't really talk too much about Baptist Hill without talking a little bit about Pine Hill Cemetery um, as well. Uh, before Baptist Hill was established, um, the African Americans in the community, so whether they were uh, enslaved or freed persons after 1865, were buried in the north end of, um, of Pine Hill Cemetery. 
And uh, if you've ever been out there and looked at that north end, um, there's not a whole lot there. You have the monument for Gatsy Rice, and there's a couple of field markers there as well. In 2010, the Auburn Heritage Association had ground penetrating radar go through there, try to identify some of those unmarked graves of enslaved persons that were buried in that, that north end. Um, and uh, they came up with about six possible um, unmarked graves, which is concerning. And so I always talk with my students about that as well, as, as we ask, well, from 1836 to um, well, almost 1870, almost 40 years, right, there's only six um, possible graves there. It seems like we're missing a lot of people, especially when we know that enslaved people had a higher mortality rate than the white population. And so if you're ever looking out in that north end, um, you may ask yourself, well, where did they go? And so what do you think? What happened? What happened? We had to be more than six. I'm sorry? Yes? Um, yeah, so maybe not, not necessarily. On, they might be. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, haven't dug to find out. Um, but Ruth, yeah. Mm. Yeah, if you're looking over that, that north wall, you'll see that there is a road there, Hare Avenue. And so we asked the question, like, okay, what happened to these individuals? We started looking in the newspapers, and certainly enough, when Hare Road wa Avenue was, was cut through there, there was a dozen to two dozen um, interments that were dug up with that, that road when it was placed. And so where that fence line ends, um, we assume that there were many burials going up in that north direction. And it's typically what you see with a lot of African American, I'm sorry, a lot of white cemeteries is off to one of the side, you'll find the interments of, of enslaved people. Um, and it's usually just right outside the main cemetery area. And it looks like that's what happened here as well, according to that newspaper article. Uh, it doesn't look like they were reinterred anywhere. The fact that they didn't know how many um, interments there were, because if they did reinter them, you would have a count. Uh, you know how many you moved. And so, um, so that's a, a sad reality um, of, of the history here in, in the South. But I always want to talk about that just to get students to think about that a little bit. All right. Okay, and so um, uh, so after we talk a little bit about the, the marker and the establishment of Baptist Hill, we then we just go a few feet over and we're going to find the grave of Amos Wynn. And many of you are probably familiar with that particular story um, as well. And so um, here's Amos, Amos's marker um, right here. And the story that, that's told about it is that Amos, he was born enslaved, and, uh, and his slaveholder was a gentleman by the name of Jeff Wynn. And one day, uh, Jeff was out um, hunting with his cousin, and there was an accident, and he was shot and, and killed. And uh, the family couldn't afford a marker at the time, and so his Jeff Wynn's grave was left unmarked. Marked. And uh, this bothered Amos Wynn quite a bit. And so Amos Wynn, after he was, um, was freed, right, he was a laborer, but he would save a little bit of money over the years um, so that he could eventually buy a marker for Jeff Wynn. And so it took him um, a, a very long time, but eventually he was able to get a marker and it's placed there, and this is a replica. The original was stolen, so this is a replica of the, the actual headstone that's there in Pine Hill Cemetery right now. But Jeff Wynn, it said, by Amos Wynn. And, um, uh, and so uh, about 20 years after Amos dies, a gentleman by the name of Charles Glenn, he, um, he hears about the story of, of Amos Wynn and, and what he went through to get this marker and he's touched by it, and so he buys a marker for Amos Wynn, who couldn't afford a marker of his own. And so this is the one that's in Baptist Hill Cemetery, right, where he talks about, you know, placing the marker for his, his former master or the, the person that, that owned him. Um, and uh, uh, this is what we talked about at the junior high this last time I was there talking to the students. Um, and in fact, Gabby, she was one of the, the presenters that was, that was here. Um, and she, came, she said, just right in the middle of the, the presentation, she's like, I don't believe he existed. She's like, I don't, believe, I don't believe this story. Why would someone buy a headstone for a person who, had, who owned them, right, and had them enslaved? And so that opened up a great conversation, right? So why, what leads to this, right? And we have to think about um, not only enslavement, and, and a lot of times we think about the physical brutality of it, we also have to think about the psychological brutality of it. And from a psychology perspective, we've, you know, most have heard about Stockholm Syndrome, right? That um, even within a couple of hours, a captive will start to identify with their captor, right? And if you can imagine someone who was born enslaved, 
and that's all they've known their entire life, they start to identify with uh, the people that, in this case, cap capture them or enslave them. And so um, it's the, 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 what we don't think about, especially I think um, at their age, they don't think about the complexity of the situation. For her to bring that up made a great opportunity to talk about how complex enslavement was. Um, and we also have a lot of literature when it comes to research on um, why individuals stay within abusive relationships, right? And so all those psychological impacts are important to this story. So when we tell the story about Jeff Wynn and Amos Wynn, which is an important story, it crosses race barriers, right? And it shows the complexity of, of enslavement. We also have to talk about the story in terms of the psychological aspects of, of it as well. There's obviously an affection between them, right? Um, but at the same time, what was the toll of that and how did that come to be? And so we tell the stories, we want our students to be thinking about the entirety of, of slavery and enslavement. And so, well, anyway, so that's a, that's a nice story that, that we talk about and I love that, that Gabby brought it up, like, you know, why would someone do that? Well, we can explain that, right, um, and, and talk about the relationships that are formed, even in, situa in, in relationships that are um, uh, unequal status. Okay, so uh, from there, um, we can head up to uh, Robert Frazier. And so Robert Frazier is an interesting um, individual. I'm going to give you just a second here to kind of take this all in. Um, so here's some pictures of Robert Frazier. There's a, a quote there by Dr. George Petrie as, as well. Um, I know I tend to keep talking, so I just want to check my time, make sure I'm not going to go over here. Okay, so... Um, so you'll notice here that you, you see a few pictures of him. Um, and so here he is in the back. So this is the, the 1892 Auburn football team, the first year that they had a football team, Dr. George Petrie. He is right here. Um, he organized this, this uh, football a game against Georgia. Um, and here's another picture of, of Robert Frazier. And so he was known by the team as Sponsor Bob Frazier or Bob Sponsor Frazier. And... Uh, um, and um, you notice down here, this quote, this is by Dr. Petrie. So Georgia had a goat for a mascot, and Auburn had a faithful Negro. And, you know, at some level, that, that, I mean, there's a couple things that should probably bother you about that, that particular statement. Um, um, but leading up to this game, Auburn had heard that Georgia was going to have a black mascot. It was going to be an elderly person who was blind. And so Auburn was thinking, okay, well, if they're going to have an African-American that's going to be their mascot, we can have one um, as well. And that ended up being Robert Frazier. He was already working as service work with Dr. George Petrie. Now, it should be pointed out that Robert Frazier, um, uh, this is after 1865, and so he's working at the university. Um, and you have to understand that Auburn University, of course, was all white for, for students and professors. And if you're African-American, you could only be on campus if you're doing service work. Right, the type of work that you would have done while you were enslaved, but now you're getting a small wage for that. Right? And so uh, he was already working with Dr. Petrie, and so he became um, the first Auburn football mascot. And I don't know how I feel about that, um, but when you think about it, that's really what it was. He predates War Eagle. He predates Obby, of course. Um, and I think the other thing that, that you know, is a little bothersome when we talk about this as well is the fact that you know, here he is. He's, he's a person, right? He's being compared to an animal, right? And, um, and we don't have to go too far back in history to see where that's happened um, before 1865 as well. And so it's an it's a interesting story. Now, both of these stories for with Robert Fraser, also with Amos Wynn, follow a particular narrative that we see quite commonly in, in southern communities. Um, one is of the, the, um, the loyal slave, right? That's kind of the Amos Wynn story. The other one is the faithful Negro. So, um, you know, after emancipation. And those are the type of stories that um, um, are remembered because we all know that who writes the history are those who have the power. And so if you identify with those who have the power, your story is going to get remembered a little bit. And that's not to, to say that this, this story is not important. It's incredibly important. Um, but we also have to think again about the broader aspects of the individuals in the time period in which they, they lived. All right, so... Um, Moving, oh yeah, I was going to say, we, we don't particularly know exactly how the African American community, community felt about Robert Frazier. If you have some information, we would love to know about that. We do know uh, a little bit about how uh, Hodge Drake was perceived. 
by the African American community by the, the the book Lest We For, Forget. Um, and so it wasn't that Hodge Drake wasn't. Uh, by the way, this is Hodge Drake. Um, he was a cheerleader for for Auburn later on, um, you know, many years after Robert Frazier. Um, but uh, we know that uh, the African American community didn't necessarily um, feel that Hodge Drake represented the community of African Americans. Um, and so a much better representation would have been his brother, Joseph Fanning Drake, who Drake uh, Middle School is named after as well. And so we don't know exactly um, Robert Frazier, how he was perceived by the African American community. Um, but we do have an idea um, of, of Hodge Drake, who identified quite well with the, the white community in Auburn, who was an Auburn um, enthusiast for the football team. So we move from there. I just want to talk a little bit about Nancy Drake just really quick here. Um, I know I used to spend a lot of time on those first two, two stops. And so uh, what I'd like to talk about with Nancy, Nancy Drake is I don't know a whole lot about her um, at all. Uh, but what I do know is that her headstone's broken. And this happened last March. And so you'll notice that there is a hose that's going across it here. And so one of the college students that live in the houses behind the cemetery, they had strung up some um, slack line and they were doing some tight roping in their backyard. And they thought it'd be a great idea to attach a hose that they're going to use as a slack line and tight rope from a tree in their yard to a tree in the cemetery. And as you can imagine, one of them fell off of it, fell on the headstone, broke it in half. And so this is a great point for me to talk with students about uh, cemetery preservation and the fact that uh, cemeteries, when you maintain a cemetery, that's the slowest possible rate a cemetery deteriorates, right? And that's maintenance. And so if you have a cemetery like Baptist Hill, where there's not active restoration of headstones, um, then um, we end up with markers that are broken that are never repaired. And uh, the city of Auburn is, is hesitant to do any repairs in Baptist Hill for um, litigation purposes. And so this marker is not going to get fixed. It's going to remain broken like this, um, which, is, which is unfortunate. So I'd like to talk about that when we walk through the cemetery as well. Um, so after Nancy Drake, I usually walk them through the, the east side of the cemetery where the unmarked graves are. Uh, and just talk about how the individuals buried here were probably individuals who did not have a whole lot of income, didn't have necessarily the funds uh, to, get, to, to get headstones. These are some of the earlier um, graves we suspect as well in the cemetery. But there is definitely a, a feeling when you're walking through there and you just see depressions in the ground. And like you know someone's there. You don't know who they are. You don't know their story. But they lived a life and they're important. And so I like to walk them through that area just so that they can see that this is pretty typical in old African-American cemeteries is these depressions in the, in the ground. Uh, from there, um, oh, there's a picture. You can't really see the depressions, but when you're walking there, you can see them. Um, we like to, uh, I like to go there down here to Jairus Purdue and talk about him just a little bit. So um, here's his marker. Uh, it doesn't have any writing on it, but Virginia Purdue, his wife, is, is next to him. Um, and so Jalis uh, uh, Purdue, he, he didn't learn how to read or write, but he sure can make a good pair of shoes. And so he caught the eye of Booker T. Washington, who was looking for individuals to teach skills at Tuskegee Institute. And he saw Jalis Purdue, and he invited him to teach at Tuskegee, which I think is, is great. And so Booker T. Washington thought that that first generation um, after, um, after 1865 should be focused on skills, and then the next generation focused on education. And so um, he was looking for those who could teach those skills, and Jalis Purdue was one of those individuals. From there, I'd like to go to um, Ephraim Drake. And so here's, a, uh, uh, here's Ephraim Drake's um, um, uh, plot as well. And, um, and there's a photograph of Ephraim Drake with um, Dr. Hodge, Dr. John Hodge Drake III. Um, and so I don't have that up here, but there is a picture of both of them together. And so Dr. John Hodge Drake III, um, he ended up going into uh, the Civil War as a Confederate soldier, well, not a Confederate drummer. Uh, and um, Ephraim Drake uh, went with him, again, as, uh, as a slave. And he was there to be a servant and also to be a bodyguard for them. And so we have Ephraim Drake, who's um, serving next to uh, John Hodge Drake III um, during the Civil, Civil War. Um, I think uh, when we think about those who we know um, quite a bit about, um, uh, Gatsy Rice, uh, Amos Wynn, Ephraim Drake, you'll notice they have this connection to the, uh, the white community as well. And again, another reason why that their, 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 um, their stories are, are, are known a little bit. 
Uh, what's interesting about Ephraim Drake's uh, story, not just that um, that um, uh, he was there next to John Hodge Drake III in, in the Civil War, um, but also, if you look, he, his wife is not buried next to him, and his wife, Sophia Drake, is actually buried in the north end of um, Pine Hill Cemetery, which is significant because that was after Baptist Hill was established, um, and so during segregation, she gets permission to be buried there in the White Cemetery, and maybe that's because family was in the, the north end of that cemetery, and they grant her that, that permission to be buried there. Um, we don't exactly know. And the other question is, we know that that road went through there. Is she still there, or was she one of those that were, were dug up? And we don't know that either. And so it ties back to, to, to Pine Hill. All right, so after uh, Ephraim Drake, I'd like to take him down to Eliza uh, Sanders. And Eliza Sanders um, is unique. Uh, you can't read it here, but it says that she lived to be 100 years old. And anyone who lives to be 100 years old needs to have some sort of story told about them. And so she, uh, um, uh, her story isn't necessarily remarkable in the sense that, you know, she did anything grand, but she typified, I think, typified the African-American experience after um, slavery. So she was do born in 1824 and died in 1923. Um, but when we look at the census records, we see a hardworking family. Everyone in the household is working. Everyone's bringing in income, right? One thing we notice about her is that she has a daughter. So Eliza is short for Elizabeth. She has a daughter named Elizabeth, right, Lizzie. And then she has a granddaughter named Elizabeth. And we see this name being carried on. And again, we don't know this for sure, but this is the image I get when I tell the story is that I see a strong black woman who's a matriarch of a family whose name is getting carried on through generations. And maybe that's inaccurate, I don't know, but that's the feeling I get when I'm there at that, at that spot. And that's what I tell, um, I talk to our students about um, as well. I'm doing good on time, by the way. I'm trying to keep them short. I could talk, like, like I mentioned before with the junior hires, like I go through 30 minutes like it was nothing. And so I'm trying to keep them a little bit briefer than I would usually do when we're walking through the cemetery. Okay, from there, I take him up to the, the uh, headstone of John Reese. And so John Reese is the, the gentleman who loaned Shell Tumor $500 so he can start uh, Tumor's drug. So um, uh, Shell Tumor was a graduate of API in pharmacy. And he was sitting on the corner looking across the street at the, the building where, uh, where he wanted to buy. And, uh, and John Reese was a drayman. And he comes down. He's doing deliveries. He's taking luggage to the, to the university for his students. And he sees... Shell Toomer sitting there, and so he asked him, Mr. Shell, um, uh, what you doing? And he said, well, I'm sitting here trying to think how I can come up with $500 to buy that store over there across the, the street. And John Reese is like, well, good luck with that, you know? And uh, he goes and makes his deliveries, right? Um, but then he stops off at home, and then he comes back, right? And he comes back, and Shell Toomer is still sitting there as the story goes, and, uh, and he pulls out a, a jar that has cash in it, and he counts out $500 and says, and says to um, Shell Toomer, I want you to get your, your pharmacy here. Please take this as a loan. So it wasn't a gift. It was a loan. You know, he got, got paid back. Um, but that really got us to thinking at, at Toomer's uh, drugs because that is a landmark in Auburn. Everything is, is around Toomer's drugs and Toomer's Corner. Um, and it's such an important landmark. So we got thinking about what other history is there at, at, um, at Toomer's drugs. And uh, it is the oldest building that's downtown, so the bricks there are made by enslaved persons. And so the history, the African-American history there is very, very strong and very deep. So we know, we know the story of Shell Toomer. We also know from, lest we forget, from, um, from the book about Auburn African-American history, that uh, um, it was reported that um, Toomer's Drugs was the only white-owned business that allowed African-Americans through the front door. Everywhere else, if it was white owned, you had to wait at the back. You had to wait for all the white customers. Now, not that, not to say that it was, um, um, you know, a desegregated utopia. There, um, they still had, even though they came through the front door, they still had to wait till all the other white customers were served first. Um, but you see that that that, and maybe because of the loan that Shell Tumor got, we don't know. But there is at least a little bit more respect given there at. Um, at, uh, um, at Tumor's Drugs. Uh, we also learn about um, James Eccles, who worked there for 40 years, known as the Lemonade Man, and who made the lemonade famous there. Um, I had a great opportunity with Kira to sit down with him and have an interview with him, um, and we did it at his home. We, we just, I showed up, we showed up, and then uh, we scheduled another time to come by, right? He was kind of, 
he wasn't sure about us at first, right? But he invited us to come back, and he invited us into our home, and uh, we had a great conversation with him. And uh, I can tell you that the lemonade they serve there now is not that famous lemonade, right? That's that may be Tumor's lemonade, but that's not James Eccles' lemonade, and so that's not the famous lemonade. Um, uh, and and I don't know. I hope he doesn't mind if I share his secret. But his secret was that the, the lemonade he made was indiv- individualized per customer. So if you wanted more syrup, you got more syrup. If you wanted a little bit more tart, you got more tart. So the recipe wasn't a set recipe. It was a changing recipe, and you got what you wanted, and that's what made it famous, right? And so, and if he knew you and he saw you coming, he'd have yours ready to go by the time you got there. And so you walk through the door, he'd have it ready for here you go, and I know what you want. So some like malt in it, some like different stuff in there, and he would mix it up to what people liked. And that's that's the the famous lemonade. What they serve now is just a a bland recipe, right? It's the same recipe for everyone, no matter what you are. And uh, and so you pay for the name of that famous lemonade now, right? <laughs> but it's not the real thing. So secret there, right? Keep that keep that recipe in in this room. So. Anyway, a rich history there um, at, at Tumor's Drugs. Um, James Eccles worked there for 40 years. He retired from there, and it was a, a great conversation um, with him. His daughter was there, Barbara. It was, it, was, um, it, was, it was great. We really appreciated them inviting us in. Oh, and so I forgot pictures. So, yeah, and so um, a picture of um, um, uh, John Reese here. Here's his headstone. And, of course, the importance of, of um, Tumor's Corner and, and Tumor's Drugs just to, to Auburn itself. And it's a history that's not really... Um, talked about, right? Um, I did look on the website, and, and I think this is great because Kira did a lot of leg work here, but now the website actually mentions John Reese's name, and it didn't do that when we started this project, and so we start to see a little bit of change there, and so, of course, it says the story goes, right, but because there's some people that dispute whether or not he gave him the, the loan or not, um, we, th- we were pretty confident based on documents that we found that he did, so. So from, from there, from John Reese, um, oh, there's James Eccles, by the way, um, lemonade man, he's there, he's serving up his lemonade, and so um, that's an older picture of him. That was actually one he had hanging up in, the, in his house um, uh, when we visited. Uh, so from there, I'd like to go to Deadison and Molly Phillips, um, and so their son, Ernest Phillips, has a street named after him in northern uh, Auburn, and, uh, um, and so... What I like to talk about when it comes to this, uh, this plot here is that both uh, Addison and Molly Phillips, they, he went by, I think, D. Phillips most of the time, um, they were um, both enslaved in um, western Georgia. I believe it was Harris County or Troop County. I can't remember which one it was. And it's a story of not being able to escape the plantation, right, and especially for, for Addison Phillips. And so, um, so, um, so obviously they were on, the pla- on a plantation before, um, emancipation. And then afterwards, they become sharecroppers, right? And if you think about it, sharecropping wasn't that a whole lot different than um, enslavement because it was a institution that kept African Americans poor, right? And you had to be renting, and sometimes the landowners um, uh, with equipment rentals and stuff like that would overcharge, and it, it kept African Americans in their, in their place, I guess, uh, in their lane, whatever it may be. Um, but they ended up uh, getting out of there, getting out of sharecropping. They come to Auburn. We don't know why, right? But they come to, to Auburn. And, uh, and uh, not long after they get here, um, Addison Phillips is arrested. And he's charged with grand larceny, and he's convicted. And we know a little bit about disproportionate co- incarceration and also convict leasing. And so he ends up going back, right, being leased out back to, to do hard labor. And so it's kind of sorry he doesn't quite get out of the situation. He's trying, it looks like, but he, just, he, can't, he can't seem to get out of it. Um, there's two things I'd like to talk about with, with him is that once he gets out, though, once he's released, uh, first of all, he comes there. If you look at, this is, by the way, um, um, uh, a convict record. It talks about you know, he's married, he has six children. And so you're coming to Auburn, you have this big family, and now you're incarcerated doing hard labor. They're trying to survive while you're, while you're serving time. And uh, he gets out, right, and um, uh, ends up, uh, and he's, he's doing upholstery now. He's doing, um, um, it says his occupation, he's a chair maker, right? But he starts a business in downtown Auburn and becomes quite successful. So there is a positive story ending to, 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 to his story there. Um, what i like to point out as well, and by the way, here's a, a convict record for Mose Harper. You're going to notice something here. So first of all, they're very detailed. They tell you a lot about the individual. And so when you look at these convict rec- records, you see that uh, 
as in Phillips, right? He's missing two upper teeth, and uh, he has a bony face. It gives him his height and his weight. But here it talks about marks and scars. And I like to point this out when we talk about it here from Moe's Harper as well. You see that marks and scars, they have packed it, right? It is, it is full. And, and you see that a lot with African Americans who were um, enslaved or in the sharecropping system, that it was brutal, right? And the scars on your body show how brutal it was. And I think that's a great thesis for one of my students at some point to do is to look at these convict records, convert, convict records and, um, and, and look at how they compare to um, white con convicts and see as far as the scars, is there a dispar uh, disparity? What I've seen just looking through them, there is a big disparity, and it just goes to show how brutal enslavement was. Um, and that gets students to think a little bit about that time period um, as well. Uh, from the, the Phillips, um, I then like to, to go to Buena Vista person. I won't talk a whole lot of, about her. Uh, I don't know if Tam was going to talk about her a little bit as well. But what I'd like to point out is that Buena Vista, that's her name. She was married to Madison person, so that's her last name. Um, she was from Georgia. I'm going to guess Buena Vista, Georgia, maybe. I don't know, but that's my guess. So, um, so that is a place, and so, but I don't know. Um, so, but what is unique about hers is that her name is on about 20 to 25 headstones in the cemetery um, as the name of a fraternal organization. What is surprising is that she doesn't have her own headstone. So her name's all over the cemetery and she doesn't have a headstone of her own. Her husband has one, Madison Person. Her parents, Hannah and Alfred Battle, they have stones. They're all part of the fraternal organization, the Buena Vista Chamber um, organization, but she doesn't have one herself. And we think it's the plot right next to Madison, but we don't know for sure. And if you know, that'd be great to, to know and get on our records um, as well. So after Buena Vista person, I like to talk, oh, there's her, there's a family plot, and so here's Madison, here's, uh, I believe, Alfred, and now here's Hannah, H Hannah, you'll see on the marker the Bunny uh, V person, she went by short, uh, she went by Bunny, so but it's Buena Vista person chamber um, here in, in Auburn, um, Alabama. So after Buena Vista person, I'd like to take students to Paul Grant's um, headstone, and there's a couple things I'd like to talk about with Paul Grant. First of all, he is the only interred veteran there that was killed in action. And you see the date here, February, February 14th, Valentine's Day, um, 1951. Um, so far as we know, he's the only one that was killed in action in a, in a foreign war. Um, he was 17, if you're, looking at, if you're looking at those dates and you're doing your subtraction, your math's correct, right? So 17 years old, and he loses his life in Korea, fighting for... Um, a country, right, that believes in freedom, that didn't give him his all all the freedom and rights that we would expect, especially in a segregated South. And so, to me, that's remarkable. First of all, it's heartbreaking, but secondly, it's remarkable that the um, dedication to a country that doesn't quite see you as equal. Um, and I think that's really, really important for students to think about um, that he gave his life at such a young age. Something that's unique is that if you look at his application, um, so his mother filled out his application for the, the, um, the, the military uh, headstone there, you're going to notice that the um, Christian marker has been erased. So there's a check mark, like what marker do you want? You know? And so they give several different religi religious options. And you've seen that the Christian marker has been uh, erased. Um, and you notice that he does not have a cross on his marker. And his brother does, who's, who's right next to him. And um, we don't know for sure, but this is what I imagine. I imagine a mother who is grieving for her, her child who died at 17, right, taken from her. And I don't know if this is the case, but this is what I think of as, as at a moment of trial of your faith, uh, that she didn't want this marker to have a Christian marker on it. And we don't know why. Um, we know that his brother has one. Um, and so um, it's just interesting when you look at that and you see that it's been, you see it faintly as been, it's been erased. And so it's just... Um, I think it's heartbreaking in little ways. Okay, so um, I know I'm just about out of time, but I'm going to do one more. I'm going to do one more. Tamla's giving me the head nod, so she says, yeah, go for it. Okay, and so I like to, I like to also uh, stop at, at John Cobb here. And so here's John Cobb's. And, and actually, we, have, we do have three pictures in the, um, lest we forget, uh, of John Cobb. 
Um, he was a, a sergeant in the Alabama Color Troops during the Spanish Spanish American War, which is very interesting. There's a picture of him in his uniform in the Lest We Forget um, a book. Um, and uh, um, another thing we, we note about him is that uh, his family relationship, so um, his father was a white man. His mother worked in the kitchen of where his father uh, lived. Now, obviously, they didn't have a long-term relationship, and we don't know what the situation of, you know, where he came to be, um, but we do know there's a power differential there, of course, but she ends up um, getting pregnant, and that's how we get John, um, John Cobb. What I think is particularly interesting is if you're looking at the census records and looking at the, the records that are available, you notice something in the 1900 census is that John Cobb's wife, Lula Cobb, who's, sitting, who's resting right next to him, um, she is working as a servant in the house of John Cobb's father. Right? And so John Cobb's father, by the way, was Thomas. So it's John T. Cobb. His middle name is Thomas. That's his father's name, Thomas Cobb, a white man who's married to another you know, white woman. And uh, in his house is John Cobb's wife. So essentially it's like his daughter and kind of like daughter-in-law, whatever you want to call it. And so you start thinking about just how complex relationships are between whites and blacks at that time. That, you know, and I don't know, for me, I don't know if, if, if I knew that <laughs> my father impregnated my mother to have me. I'm not sure if my wife would be working in that same house as, as a servant. Um, I don't know. But the relationship definitely is, is interesting, to say, to say the least. And so, um, so I'd like to talk about that one a little bit. Uh, what I do notice in the pictures of, of John Cobb, he's very light-skinned. He's very fair-skinned. Again, because his father being white and his mother, I think, is listed as, as mulatto as being biracial in one of the ones as well, and it gave him a really light skin complexion. What I really find fascinating, again, with my, because of my family history, is the fact that um, I think just based on the pictures that if he really wanted to, he could have gone anywhere and maybe passed as white. But he did not. He stayed here, and he acknowledged his, his ethnic heritage, and I, I give him a lot of credit for that, especially here in, in, in the South. Um, I know for my family that was not the case. My great-grandmother chose a different route, and so... Um, so anyway, so I'll, I'll stop there. I didn't include everyone that we talk about as we walk through the, the cemetery just because of time here, but this kind of gives you a snapshot of what we talk about um, for any new students that, that want to get involved with the project, get them thinking a little bit about what they're getting themselves into and about the time period and, and what's going on um, in the community. Um, and again, as I, I've talked to this, if there's anything I missed that's important or anything that I've misspoken about, please let me know because I find that I'm always making adjustments to my tour based on the information I collect. And sometimes those, those stories change a little bit. And so please feel free to, to let me know um, as well. And I just, just want to close just by talking about um, race relations is complex, right? And a lot of times, especially for, for the young students, they think that it's black and white, right? No pun intended when it comes to race relations, but there is, it is more complex than um, we think. And that makes it really hard to write stories about it. We have to think about the time period and think about that complexity. So.